My colleague, Matthias Nieberg, and I, we wrote this paper a couple of years back. And this was in the context of a collaboration project between Scania and KTH. And um, yes, I'm still involved with both these companies. I'm actually employed by, by Scania, the uh, heavy trucks manufacturer. But I also, partly, I also do research still uh, associated with KTH. And I work in the rigorous systems engineering group. So if you, uh, if you find this talk interesting, we have continued this work, and you can read up on our, uh, on our work, current, on our current work on this website. So um, this talk concerns contracts. So I'll start to give a very short introduction to what contracts in this context is. So it was introduced back in 1992. Actually, the term was introduced in 1992 in a paradigm called design by contract. Uh, but the ideas can trace back, be, be traced back to much earlier work on, uh, like in horror logic in the 60s and compositional reasoning in the 80s. But basically what it is, it's an interface specification for a software component. And here I have a very simple example to try to illustrate what it is. So here we have a contract for the implementation of our logarithmic function. And essentially, we have a precondition which states under which uh, assumptions this, this implementation should be used in order to guarantee the, pre uh, the post condition here. So in this case, this implementation will guarantee that the output here will be the logarithmic function of an input x, but only giving, uh, given that this function is called with an input that is greater than x. And so, well, <laughs> um, what we have looked at, because I worked uh, at Scania also at that time, is that we want to use this, want to use it like a theory uh, that is more general than just for software, because we work with embedded systems. So there, is a, there was an extension to this uh, contract theory for software uh, back sometime in 2009 to include cyber physical systems, basically it was an extension to any type of domain, such as software, hardware, or physical. And in this context, a contract is a pair consisting of an assumption and a guarantee, basically the same as a precondition and a postcondition. And here I have an example in, in this context of cyber-physical systems, where this component instead is a pressure sensor. And then we have an assumption on its environment that the pressure outside will only be below a certain value, because here I'm assuming that the pressure sensor will not work, or it might even break if the pressure is below that, uh, higher than that value. And given that this environment uh, implements this assumption, then the pressure sensor will guarantee that its output voltage will be a function of the pressure. Um, so this contract theory for cyber-physical systems, to be able to capture this uh, big domain, uh, it, 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 uh, it's based on a, a very um, general formalism, a language or computation-independent formalism, where component behaviors are simply represented by a set uh, of trajectories over variables. So here I try to make, oh. Uh, it's OK. It will come back? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> there we go. I uh, pushed the wrong button. So here I made an example for this. Here we have a behavior which, which are over these two variables, x and y. And the behavior of these variables will then be a set of these tra trajectories over these two variables in time. So this is a very generic way of representing components and component behaviors. And the way we compose components is through intersection. So you take, when you take two different component behaviors uh, and you try to integrate them to a system, you compose these sets using intersection. And a contract in this theory uh, is also represented using these type of behavior sets. Oh no, not the, uh, they're represented as sets of runs rather, <laughs> or trajectories. Um, so th they are all, both the component behaviors the assumption and the guarantee are all represented using these uh, sets of trajectories. And so in the context of this theory, say that we have a contract for a component B1, as in this case, 
and we want this component to satisfy the contract, then this means that we have to, uh, that this condition has to hold. That is, that the assumption intersected with the behavior of the component is to be a subset of the guarantee. And the complementary conditions on an environment to this component is, uh, in here, is an environment component B2, is that B2 is supposed to be a subset of the assumption. And given that these conditions hold, then this will imply that the composition of the environment component and the component will be a subset of the guarantee, meaning in this context that the guarantee is fulfilled. So these are the basic satisfiability conditions of these contracts in this theory. And so now we'll step back a bit and, and give some history to this. So uh, basically when we encountered this theory, this was back in 2010, 2011, and at that time, we, I also, also worked in this collaborative uh, effort between SCAN and KTH. And um, the kind of the systems engineering environment at SCANIA was at that time very much driven by agile and leave development and not as much by very much structured documentation. And most of the well, documentation was also not being formalized but would rather exist in, in un undigitalized formats in Word and Excel and so forth. But at the same time, there were these safety standards, one in particular, ISO 26262, which enforced very strict, um, a very strict system engineering approach with a very strict requirements uh, breakdown from a top level all the way down to software and hardware. And so we thought, okay, why don't we try to use this overall contracts theory uh, to, as a framework to be able to structure our systems engineering here. So basically, that's what we set out to do in 2011. And what we found out is that, I mean, we needed to very much go into depth in this theory and also look at all the practical things in the context, in, in the engineering context. And then we, what we found out is that we actually had to go back then and to improve this contract theory in order to, to fit in this, uh, uh, in this context. So that was a bit about the background to this talk. Um, yeah, it's better. <laughs> Thank you. Hello? 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 <laughs> Hello? Okay. Two seconds. Hello? <laughs> there we go. Um, so, um, what we did then was to try to apply this theory, as I said, and we found basically two main concerns when, when trying to apply this theory. And those are the ones that I will first discuss here. And then I will talk about how we addressed these concerns. And these are basically the contribution of this paper. And after that I will talk about the continuation after this paper, because it was quite a, it was basically several years ago that we actually wrote this paper. So I will talk a little bit about what has happened since then. And so one thing we saw is that in this contract theory, uh, the base here was that contracts, uh, how it was allocated in this theory, is that contracts would be uh, expressed over the interfaces of these components. And what we saw pretty fast was basically that that in practice, looking at how the, the engineers were specifying requirements, this was not always true. Rather, in many cases, although they were not expressed as contracts, uh, the, the guarantee, basically the requirement on a component stretched uh, outside of the scope of, of the component itself. So basically, you, um, the way it was handled, the requirement had a greater, uh, so, Basically, what was being done is that requirement was assigned to a particular uh, component that had a greater responsibility, but in, in the context of an outside uh, environment here. And this was also kind of the way that was described in safety standards of how you can express these type of relations between requirements. And when, when we also read about you know, these kind of um, uh, formulations of what the contract was, then the formulations was not at all limited, uh, the contracts were not limited to be express, uh, expressed solely over the interface of the component. 
So we thought, okay, why don't we just relax this condition and have more, more generalized contracts that we can express in this manner instead to, to, for added flexibility. And I will now um, present some examples where we saw, I mean, why this was uh, necessary to do. So here we have an example. Uh, this is an example from the Scania context uh, of the implementation of a fuel level system. So in this picture here, we have a picture of a fuel tank. And here we have variable representing the actual fuel volume in the tank. We have some sensor here. And here we have an overall ECU. And on top of that, we're executing an application software component here. And then we are, uh, as an output of this entire ECU, we have something going out to CAN, uh, basically the, the communication network. And we also take in other signals, such as fuel rate, to be able to compute, uh, to evaluate this, this signal, uh, this uh, quantity over here. And basically, the, the application software component is, is quite a complex implementation, since you cannot really rely on the fuel sensor here when, when you are moving all the time in the truck. So that means you have to take in a bunch of other signals here and try, so in order to try to, to estimate this value. And so if you would actually want to specify the requirement on the application software component from input to output directly, that would be a quite uh, difficult uh, requirement to specify. And instead, a more intuitive way of specifying this, the engineers, they were specifying it as the overall responsibility of this application software component. Rather, that its, its role was to implement a relation between the total fuel level here and the actual fuel volume over here, that it should not deviate more than plus minus 5%. So this was the requirement on the application software component. But comp co in complement to this requirement, in the application software component specification, we also had assumptions on the environment in, in which it would be executing. So assumptions on the hardware and the sensors and the actuators to bind the interface of the application software component to its environment. So this is the way uh, it was specified. And for me, it is quite intuitive to say that the, the responsibility of this component is to guarantee this, not to guarantee uh, certain transformations from its inputs to its output. And in essence, this way of specifying uh, the specification for this component can definitely be expressed with this type of a generalized contract in this manner, but it cannot be expressed in the same, with the same flexibility using these interface contracts. And we have another example. Uh, so in, in this safety standard, ISO 262, we have basically what you do is you, you're supposed to apply the standard on a subsystem of your vehicle and basically prove that this is safe, but only in a certain context. And the analysis you do here uh, on the subsystem is always in the context of the entire condition or behavior of the vehicle. This means that you, when you also specify the overall safety requirements for, items, for the item, it's always specified in terms of the, the vehicle, uh, the behavior of the entire vehicle. And the way you still prove that the item is safe is that you bind together uh, the, the item with assumptions on the environment in which it will be deployed in to prove that given that these assumptions on the deployment hold, then it will also guarantee the overall safety requirements. And this is utterly explicit when you look at uh, a certain part of the standard where you where it talks about safety element other contexts that are basically parts of an item that is developed uh, out of context, not in a certain environment. And there, you, it very, it's very clear that you need to specify the assumptions on the context in which, it will in which it will be deployed in. And when you read about these different examples of how to specify these assumptions, they talk about a lot of variables and quantities that are at the vehicle level, not at the interface of this subsystem, such as the front wheel, wheel driven vehicles, maximum road slope, uh, the, the driver, and things like that. And a final example that I used the same picture here 
is when you, we are working with, uh, uh, with suppliers. And the way we, if we, for example, want to buy a brake system from a supplier, we will typically not come up with a, with a specification that is simply limited across the interface of this component. We would rather say, okay, we want uh, to be able to brake. This is the general requirement. And then they will say, okay, in order for us to be able to guarantee this braking, then we would have to assume certain things of the input signals that you provide us in, in your context. And again, so this type of flexibility in specifying these, these, uh, these contracts cannot be made with, if you only specify it across the interfaces, but it can be captured with these type of more generalized contracts. So why are generalized contracts needed? I would say both to support practical engineering, but also to properly express safety requirements, at least as advocated in the safety standards. Um, so now I talked about one of the concerns with this theory, uh, but now I'll also talk about a second one. And this is, has, is more, uh, more of a mathematical thing here. And the way to describe this, it's easier to describe it in the context of this use case, where we have a client and we have a supplier. And basically we want the supplier to develop a component and we will do that in the context of this contract. So we send a contract to a supplier and the supplier develops a contract, uh, a component that meets the conditions of the, con uh, of the contract. And then we take this component and we can integrate it with other components into a system. So, but if we look at these, the existing contract conditions for the uh, cyber-physical systems contract theory, uh, as I said before, the conditions then on the supplier, which is supposed to develop a component that meets the contract, is that the assumption and the behavior of the component is to be a subset of the guarantee. And the conditions on the client then would be that this B2 is supposed to be a subset of the assumption here. And this, as I said, guarantees that the composition is a subset of the guarantee. However, it does not guarantee that B2 and B1 is, the, is not the empty set. So basically, uh, it, which, which in this context would illustrate a, a, a contradiction between these two designs, which means that this system would never be able, would never be able to be realized in practice. And then we asked us, okay, how to ensure realizability in these cases? Um, and there I give you these two concerns that we had. And then I was talking about, okay, how did we address these concerns in this paper? So again, to summarize, the context here, or rather this, the, the problem or challenge that we wanted to address was the, in this type of context where we had this client-supplier relation uh, how do we ensure that we, in the end, we end up in a system that fulfills the guarantee, of course, but where we also allow these uh, generalized contracts and we always guarantee that the system is also possible to design, that is, it's possible to realize. So expressed more formally, what we want is, is this. We want the composition to be a subset of guarantee, but we also want it to not be the empty set in essence. And we started out with these conditions as given that we, we took from the previous contract theory. And then we, we quickly found out that, okay, if we have a behavior, um, if the behavior two, uh, in the intersection of the behavior two with the guarantee, if this is the empty set, then this will always lead to that the composition is the empty set which means that it is a necessary condition that the, the, this component behavior in the sector of the guarantee must not be uh, the empty set. And then, during these, uh, with these, given these conditions, uh, we basically um, present a complementary condition on the supplier. And he, this is basically the, the main theorem of the, pr uh, of the paper, where we present the necessary and sufficient conditions, given these, to ensure that this is the case. So we present these clear separations of conditions on the, of the, on the supplier and the client with respect to the contract to always be able to guarantee this 
And what we then do in the paper is also, since we have introduced these new conditions, we, we show the implications of these new conditions on operators and relations, such as refinement and conjunction and all these different things, and prove that what, what would be the result, the new conditions uh, to prove compositionality of contracts, for example. And I will not talk about this in, in much detail, but you can look at it in the paper. But in essence, for example, uh, we have these type of uh, properties that are called consistency and compatibility, where consistency in general means that there exists a component that meets the contract conditions, and compatibility means that uh, if there exists an, exists an environment that meets the contract conditions. And this is, of course, relevant also in this use case of a finite supplier because it's not very nice if we send out a contract and there doesn't exist any component that can actually uh, satisfy this contract. But because we have introduced this new type of conditions, we have to redefine these in terms of these new conditions. What does it actually mean? Uh, what does it actually mean in this in this new context? And how can we provide uh, conditions that we can actually check? And as I say, I will not go into details regarding this, but we have, uh, yeah, we propose conditions for this in, in the paper. And also for other type of relations and, uh, and operators. Uh, but what I will s instead talk more about is uh, the continuation of this work, which I frankly will say is more interesting than <laughs> these things. Uh, so basically, because we had a very nice dialogue in several turns when we talked uh, with uh, very good reviewers in this paper. In, a, in essence, they were arguing that the, their intuition would say that the conditions are way too strong uh, on the component. So to illustrate that, I have a contract here where the assumption is, is supposed to be true, it has no, uh, uh, no constraints whatsoever, and the guarantee is that X should always be uh, less than five. And if you, if you apply the conditions for this case, this actually means that basically the only acceptable behavior here is one that matches the guarantee exactly. Which is not very, it's, it's quite a, it's a very strict condition on the behavior of this component. And it doesn't really meet the, the intuition of, of these kind of uh, conditions that you want to have. And for example, a reviewer argued that given such a contract, for example, if we have a behavior to always put x equal to zero, then that should be an acceptable uh, implementation of this contract. But this behavior does not meet those conditions that we, uh, that we presented. But, I mean, what we prove is actually that the, co the conditions are sufficient and necessary. And, and in the considered context, however, because basically in this case, uh, if we have uh, this behavior that says x uh, equal to one, here we can have, there are, since the assumption is true, it means we, we don't enforce any, uh, any constraints on the environment whatsoever. So we can might as well have a component here that puts x to whatever uh, value possible, as long as it does not contradict the guarantee. So we would have to accept any type of, of these types of behavior of the environment in order to make the overall system realizable. However, what, what you could also think about is that, I mean, we show that this is, uh, these conditions are sufficient and necessary in the considered context. But what we could also talk about is, I mean, is the use case here too restrictive? And what we also can discuss is, is the theory overall too restrictive in, in capturing these, this use case and these type of conditions? So in essence, if we first talk about is the use case too restrictive? So here we have different types of use cases. For example, one, we did not, uh, in this paper, since we're talking about cyber physical systems, we never assumed the causality of ports here. So any port can be bidirectional, it can always be uh, constrained by both the component and the environment. But if you assume that we always have a causality of ports, then the, 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 the same conditions are way too strict. And I think that that was maybe uh, the thing, the, this intuition, because typically we would have a contract here 
the guarantee might constrain only an output port. And if X in this case was an output port, then we know that no environment can actually enforce these constraints. The environment must be receptive to that port. And in such a context, uh, these conditions are way too strict that we presented. And also, there might be also be a case where we don't have this very strict uh, separation between the, the client and the supplier. Here we are assuming the context where the only information shared is in the contract, in the assumption of the guarantee. But if we also included other information, then we could take that information into consideration and we could relax the, the conditions. However, what was also interesting here is that, I mean, both these cases require additional information that, was, that, was, that can be shared in the contract. Basically, here we need to know the architecture and the direction of the ports. And in this other case, we would have to know something else about uh, the implementation. We have to share information about the, the specific behaviors here and here. And so we ask ourselves, OK, uh, why can't we put this information in the contract itself? And the interesting thing that in this theory, we cannot do that. We cannot put in an assumption, for example, that B2, B2 shall not be able to constrain or be receptive to X. So we cannot enforce these type of conditions uh, about, for example, receptivity or constraining variables in the contract itself. And we can also not express, for example, that the assumption, uh, in an assumption that that B2 should not be the empty set, or that the overall composition should not be the empty set. And that is a, a restriction on the, uh, and, and because we cannot do that, we also lack the expressive power to properly specify nicely, nicely, nicely conditions, because we cannot directly reason about these use cases. So, what we found out then is that, I mean, if we look at, is that if we look at the generalization even of this very general contract theory, and we, for example, instead of, of having the behaviors at the same level as the specification, we move and uh, we consider specifications as assumption and guarantee as sets of behaviors instead of just sets of runs, and we check implementation with set membership rather than the subset relation. We, we, of course, get full expressiveness with respect to behaviors. And that also means that we can embed additional information in the contract themselves. For example, we can express that, that we, don't, we do not desire the empty set to be a solution. We can express that explicitly in the contract. We can also, also express, for example, that we, requ we require, for example, that uh, any environment must be receptive to certain ports, that it, we, we, we require uh, uh, like that it's supposed to be an, uh, an input of the environment. And this we have discussed in a paper that you can read if you find these things interesting. We have in this paper we consider this generalized form of theory and we, we derive new theorems and such for, for uh, different conditions of contract. So basically as a summary um, here, I would say that these type of generalized contracts are definitely needed to give some added flexibility when specifying contracts. Um, what we found was that CPS contract theory is, is not sufficiently expressive to cover important use cases. But I don't think it's, it was the right way to introduce uh, uh, additional conditions in the same theory, but I think a, a better way is to to uh, consider a more expressive theory to cover these use cases. And this is something that we are currently working on.
what should have been an unrelated part of the system. Now, in some cases this may be not so bad, but in other cases, especially whenever the service in the, in the top left is a low priority service and the service on the bottom right is a high priority service, um, then this definitely is something that you want to report. And this is what we call the bottom problem. Okay? Now, if you want to solve such a bottom problem, then there are essentially two activities that you need to engage in. First, you need to sort of analyze your architecture and figure out uh, why these dependencies that you have cause the sensitivity of this one service to this other service. Right? And after you've done this analysis, then you need to figure out if there are a number of architectural refactorings that you can apply such that this, uh, this sensitivity is broken. Now, it turns out that uh, these two activities are actually quite contrary, quite challenging to do. So, first of all, it's just a very intellectually demanding thing you know, to, to analyze all your, all your dependencies. It's a lot of work, and perhaps most pro pro problematically, it's very easy to miss certain sensitivities or miss certain refactorings. So, uh, we've been in contact with the, with the lead architect at a software company, and he says, you know, what these architects typically, typically do is they just you know, do this kind of reasoning based on experience and best practices. And if you do this based on experience and best practices, then you're most of the time going to find the most you know, intuitive or natural solutions. But those might not be the, tech, the technological or the technically uh, superior solutions, right? So, um, what we want to do in this project is develop tool support um, to help software architects solve bottom problems like this. Uh, and we don't want to just you know, start programming and implement the tool, no, we also want to have the, the Git basis in some sense, a rigorous foundation so that we have Certain, you know, mathematical guarantees about the correctness of the results of the tools. In particular, we want the tool to be able to automatically find refactorings um, that solve the problem, and then we want to say, be able to say that these refactorings are provably correct, in the sense that they preserve the semantics of the problem. So this is what we want to do, and I think the interesting thing about this project, at least for me personally, is that I didn't invent it. This is, in some sense, a company-driven project. So the lead architect that I mentioned previously, he actually came to us and asked us, you know, we have in our, in our company, uh, this company is called First Aid, it's, in their own words, it's a, it's a company that specializes in custom, grid, business critical software systems, including lots of service-oriented -orient systems. And he says, you know, the architects that work with our company, they face these kinds of button problems essentially on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, they struggle with the challenges that I mentioned in the previous slide. It would be very, very nice for us if we could indeed have such a tool that helps us. If we really want it to be formal as well, because when we use this tool, when we use this tool, when we actually deploy it and try to solve our clients' problems with it, then we want to be able to say that you know, there is a mathematical basis based on top of, on top of which all of this stuff is built. So. This being, in some sense, this company-driven project, there are a number of requirements that I would never have come up with if I would have done this myself, and I want to highlight two of them. So the first of them is that we need to remain at somehow a kind of white right level of abstraction, by which I mean that we need to abstract away as much information as possible from the architecture models based on which we do our reasoning. And the reason that this is important to the company is because they say, well, good solutions, they're of course nice. But what's even nicer in practice is that we're able to convince the people in charge right, that these solutions are actually the right solutions. And to, so typically what happens is that they have these relatively short meetings, let's say one hour, where they um, you know, present a number of alternative solutions to, to their client and they discuss the trade-offs and the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and uh, well, because it's only one hour, they obviously don't have time to go into all the technical and so, basically, they have to explain these refactorings and these solutions in terms of, you know, on a, on, for instance, on a whiteboard, and there's not a lot of time to you know, discuss many of those details. So, um, it's important for this tool to be based on, let's say, an architecture model that's in some sense similar to the kind of whiteboard model that these people would, would, uh, would make during those, uh, those kinds of meetings. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, this bottom problem, although it is very much about performance, at the end of the day, it's not really about the quantities, right? So we're not interested in things like you know, reducing the latency by, I don't know, 100 milliseconds or by 
driven through by some quantity. It is, in some sense, much more, let's say, coarse grained. It's about coarse grained performance predictability. The only thing we want to establish is that whatever leaves the surface here, something there does not go wrong. Okay, so that's a non quantitative statement. It means that although we probably could use quantitative methods to find solutions for these kinds of potent problems, this is probably over. This is too much because we would not be, you know, actually um, taking advantage of the added precision that quantitative methods would, would, would give us. But then, at the same time, we would, you know, have some of their disadvantages, things that are impractical, especially also from an automation point of view. So we try to be as non-quantitative as possible. Um, okay, this is what I just said. So I want to right. So we built this tool. Elmo, uh, it's open source, so you can download it from this link. And uh, it has two main features. First, we support a kind of automated, non quantitative analysis on the architecture models uh, so that you can you know, figure out which are the actual sensitivities between services in the system. And then we also provide a kind of an inference engine that automatically infers a series of refactorings towards a given insensitivity goal. And this is you know, a, a statement of the form. Whenever we press buttons on this surface, uh, this other surface should be insensitive to these activities. Okay. Now, we did a number of case studies already. Um, we did an e-commerce case study and uh, an agricultural system in the Netherlands. Those are all uh, customers, or the systems are uh, from customers from, uh, from the company. And the two main findings in these case studies was that um, it made, in some sense, the, uh, so the software architects more productive. So, using the tool, they were uh, find these refactorings faster. Uh, and at the same time, the tool, the tool produced refactorings that the software architects did not come up with themselves. Okay? And well, these were basically the two reasons why the company wanted to develop the tool in the first place. This was for us a very encouraging result, and so we, uh, we kept on developing this one. Um, so we presented the tool already last year at Ixoc, um, and so I'm not going to be talking about the tool that much actually today, because the point of this paper was to also provide this formal foundation, yeah. and uh, that's what I want to talk about in the remaining, uh, remaining part of the presentation. So I want to do basically discuss three things, I guess. Uh, I want to talk about these architectural models um, that we use inside the tool. Uh, I want to talk about refactoring, and I want to talk about uh, this non-quantitative analysis. So let me start with the architectural models, and I don't want to show you any definitions on the Friday afternoon, so I just want to do it by means of an, uh, means of an example. And this is a simplified version of system that we, uh, that we did this uh, case study with. And so definitely we're going to need a number of services and in this simplified version we'll have five of them. So on the top right we have uh, a checkout service which is basically the front end of the system and this is the most high priority service of the whole system because uh, I think it is uh, by now sort of folklore in e-commerce that if your checkout is a little bit slow then it will definitely you know, have a significant uh, negative in impact on your Revenue. So uh, it's very important that this checkout service is uh, uh, as performant as possible. Now we have a database in the middle that stores product information and order information. Uh, we have a back office on the bottom left which is responsible for pushing new information, new product information into the database. There's an accounting service that is used to, for instance, generate invoices or generate weekly revenue reports for management. And then there's a pricing service that calculates final prices, including uh, taxes and uh, shipping fees, that kind of stuff. So these are the services, and to represent the dependencies between the services, we'll just draw edges between them, and we distinguish between two kinds of operations. We have pushes and pulls, and uh, pushes are essentially, if I push information, I just, you know, in a fire and forget kind of fashion, I send this information to this other service, and immediately afterwards I can continue, so I don't need to wait for it. Uh, the pulls are more of the request re response kind of operations. So, for instance, the office on the bottom left it will push new product information into the database, whereas the checkout service it will pull this product information from the database and it will push new order information into the database. And what we often do is we annotate the edges with the types of the information that uh, are involved in these operations. And then uh, we have nothing else. So this is already the whole model. You can imagine that you actually draw this on the whiteboard. So this was meeting to meet one of the requirements 
So this being something that you could draw on the whiteboard, this is essentially the syntax of our architecture models. But when we do refactoring, I mean, anything in the syntax can change. We don't, we don't care about that so much. But we want the semantics, the behavior of the architecture to be, to be preserved. Now, at this level of abstraction, not, there's not so much behavior that you can actually reason about, right? But for one thing, we know nothing about the dynamics of the services or of the composition of the model. Um, the only thing that we actually know about the behavior of the system is the information phase. Okay? And so when we do a refactoring, what we want to preserve is essentially the information flows between the services. So if, for instance, if the checkout service can receive product information, then after refactoring, um, the checkout service should still be able to, to get this uh, product information. And so <coughs> there's actually uh, two facets, two aspects of this uh, information flows that we, uh, that, we, that we analyze, that we reason about. The first one is the direction of the flows, and this is essentially what I you know, talked about uh, just previously. Uh, we, we derive this automatically from the syntax, and we use this kind of lollipop arrow um, to, to point into the direction of the data flows. But there's another aspect, of, uh, aspect as well that's important to us, namely the initiative, right? Which service um, well, takes the initiative for certain information flows to emerge? So for instance, um, the, uh, the office service here takes the initiative to you know, push this new public information into the database. Uh, but the checkout service, it also takes the initiative to receive this uh, product information from the database, uh, but uh, the initiative, uh, but so in this case, that goes from the checkout to the database, but the actual information flow is in the other direction. And when you do refactoring, we don't really care about preserving the initiative, um, but we do need the initiative to reason about the sensitivities of the system. But I will come back to that later. So we have abstracted away a lot of things. I want to emphasize this. Um, we don't know anything about the call specifics, like the actual arguments of the calls. We don't know any quantitative aspects, like you know, how often does a call uh, happen or occur. Uh, we don't know anything about transport characteristics, like network latency or bandwidth, all that stuff we abstracted away intentionally. Okay, so we wanted to make this model as bare as possible and still be able to do some form of reasoning. Okay, so let me talk now about refactoring. Um, our view on this is that we sort of perceive an architecture model, if we want to refactor, as an old part that we want to replace, that we want to refactor, and a remaining part that we want to and so then we can say that you know this whole architecture is essentially the composition of the old part and the remaining part. And the refactoring just means that we're going to replace the old part with a new part. And uh, for the refactoring to be correct, we want these two architectures to be equivalent. Right? Now, one thing we could do, of course, in the tool is that we try to prove the equivalence, the behavioral equivalence between those architectures every time when we do the refactoring, but that would be kind of silly, or at least not very efficient. So we want to do it in a compositional way. And um, this essentially means that we want this composition of this, this equivalence relation to be a congruence. Because then it suffices to just prove that the old part is equivalent to the new part. And then, because it's a congruence, we also know for sure that in the composition, uh, the composition, the, well, the final composition is not equivalent as well. So what we need are essentially uh, two ingredients. We need to have this composition operator, which essentially is a graph union. And we can very straightforwardly prove the theorem that this composition preserves uh, the existing information flows in the parts that are to be composed. And we also need this equivalence relation. And as I was preparing the slides, I sort of realized that it's quite difficult to explain this equivalence in, in you know, half a slide or in a few sentences. So I decided that I'm not going to do that. I just want to give you some kind of an intuition. And the intuition here is that this notion of equivalence is very much inspired by, by simulation. So essentially what we do is we have two architectures and we say that every service in this architecture is supposed to be, be able to simulate be simulated by a group of services in the other architecture and vice versa. Okay. Now this is a very rough description um, and um, well if you want to better details there of course in the, in the paper. I have actually an example on the next one today that will make it a little bit more clear. And then we also prove of course that this equivalence is a coordinate structure. So that are then the main ingredients of this So let me give you an example. Uh, here on the left, we see the, um, the direction graph for this, uh, this web shop example. I know I already mentioned that this database contains 
product information and order information. Um, it is, in this case, quite conceivable that these kinds of information get sort of disjoint. So we should be able to split the database into two disjoint databases, and uh, then we would get you know, the architecture on the right. And now we can say that these two architectures, that they are indeed equivalent because the database on the left can be simulated by the two databases based on the right and vice versa. This is sort of, you know, uh, in a very tiny nutshell, how this equivalent uh, works. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, having this uh, sort of framework in place, what we now can do is we can define a refactoring as a pair of a uh, system of uh, a predicate and a function. Where the predicate sort of identifies the architectures to which the refactor can be applied, and the function actually transforms the, uh, the architecture. And so we then say that such a refactoring pair is correct if for all the architectures that satisfy the predicate, it is indeed true that applying the function preserves the semantics of this uh, architecture. So we define a number of those uh, uh, refactorings, we prove that they are correct, and we put them in. Call a core library, and this, library, this is the library that our tool uses um, to, uh, to search for, uh, uh, for refactors that solve a particular problem. Now, I cannot make any, any claims about completeness. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't even know what completeness would you know, formally mean in this context. Um, the, um, let's say the source of these refactorings is, uh, is this lead architect from the company, and then we sort of validated this set in these case studies, and at least in our case studies, this set turned out to be sufficient. I'm pretty sure that in the future we will discover other refactorings that we might want to add to this set as well. So, um, uh, yeah. um, okay, so and then there's some other stuff in the paper as well about, about this stuff. So, <coughs> so far, um, given the framework that I've discussed up to now, uh, we can sort of determine which refactorings are correct. We can say that which refactorings are actually a good idea. So, we also need to have this non quantitative analysis. Architecture models because then we can sort of, you know, apply the analysis before and after the uh, applying the refactor and see if any improvements have occurred. So let's go back to the, uh, the actual example again and let's uh, let's see that uh, actually this example already contains a button problem. So imagine that we press a button here on the, uh, the accounting service. So we call one of its operations and for instance the accounting service will now start pulling this order information. From uh, the database. Now, at the same time, this high priority checkout service is also pulling this product information from the database. But the database now is also using resources to process the requests by the accounting service. And so, um, the uh, performance of the checkout service will potentially suffer because the database now has to divide its, its resources over these two, uh, two kinds of requests. Um, so, yes, yeah, so its performance will, uh, will suffer there. And this is indeed the button. Problem that we want to solve because, as I said before, checkout is our priority, but the counter is not so much. It doesn't matter if we generate the invoices right now or we, we do it or we not. So, um, the, um, we should want to make uh, this checkout service insensitive to the accounting service. And, uh, well, the easy way to do that in this situation is indeed to recognize that this database contains product information and order information, but it can be split. Okay? And so, if we indeed um, split, <coughs> Split this uh, database into uh, to, uh, disjoint databases, then we can actually solve this problem because now the accounting service is still pulling from the other database, but the checkout service is now pulling from another database. So there can be no more interference between these, uh, between these services. Uh, the checkout service, it does still you know, push new orders into this database, but it pushes our final and forget operation. So they won't affect the performance of uh, the checkout service, at least not. Um, so, to summarize, definitely, you know, the pushes and pulls that occur in your architecture, they, they sort of determine, uh, they are an important factor in deciding uh, when two services are sensitive to each other. But this is not the only thing, actually. Because uh, we need to take into consideration also the deployments of the services. So, even if we you know, separate the two databases, if we run them on the same machine, then they still share the same set of hardware resources. So that the accounting service starts pulling from the order database, fewer hardware resources will be available for the product database and the checkout service will still so. 
So ultimately, what we need to do is we need to derive the sensitivities not only from you know, pushes and pulls in this architecture model, but we need to enrich the model a little bit by also taking into consideration the actual deployments. Okay? We call this enriched models, we call them the deployment models. And then the actual analysis is kind of a, a reachability analysis for the initiative graphs that we derive from the syntax. Okay? Based on this analysis, we can identify actually three different levels of sensitivity. The easiest one is insensitivity, when services are just completely independent of each other. Um, but we also have uh, uh, two sensitivity levels uh, if something is actually wrong. There's a notion of forced sensitivity, and this happens when, if, if I'm a service, then I'm forced, forcibly sensitive to this other service, and there is nothing that I can do you know, to break the sensitivity. This happens, the easiest way that this happens is if this other service just keeps pushing information to me. Right? I just have to process this. There's nothing that I, that I can decide to do about this. But there's also a weaker form, which we call voluntary sensitivity. And with voluntary sensitivity, there is something that I can do. And here, the simplest example is that um, there, well, there are three services. By one of them, there's a middle service, and there's a service on the left. And uh, the service on the left pushes information to the middle service, and I pull information from the middle service. Now, because we both you know, use, in some sense, this middle service, I am sensitive to this first service here on the left. But there's a very easy thing for me to, you know, to do to break the sensitivity, namely just to stop pulling from the thing. Right? So if I can get my information from elsewhere, then I can do that to make myself insensitive to the service here on the left. And it's sometimes it's useful to distinguish between these kinds of sensitivity levels. So let me go back to this uh, webshop example one more time. Um, so this is the, uh, the original situation. We have a number of sensitivities here. Some may be acceptable, some may be unacceptable. Um, the first thing that we can do you know, to, uh, to solve this is to indeed split this database. And then the second thing is that we can redeploy this order database on its own machine and then all these uh, Okay, so this is a slide that I showed you before. It's uh, about the tool, and I can now make a little bit more precise by or how we use this formalization that I uh, explained by example in the previous slides, how we use it inside the tool. So, for this uh, non quantitative analysis, essentially what we have is we have data structures that very closely correspond with the, uh, uh, with the models I've shared so far, and then we need to do this. Uh, reachability analysis on those models. And for the inference of this uh, series of factorings to solve, uh, to solve these button problems, essentially what we do is we build a huge graph. And the nodes of the graph, they are uh, the deployment models and the vertices, oh, sorry, the, the, the edges of the graph are um, refactorings. And so we start from an initial deployment model uh, and then basically in the red first manner we just try to you know, explore the entire search, the search space. Um, to find uh, deployment models that satisfy all of the uh, uh, insensitivity goals that the user has, uh, has specified. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, let me wrap up. Uh, as far as future work is concerned, what we want to do is um, on the on the theory side, uh, we'd like to be able to uh, to reason a bit more about conflicting conflicting sensitivity goals. So. Uh, for instance, you may want this service to be insensitive to that service, and that service to be insensitive to this service, but maybe you cannot achieve both. And so we want to be able to identify deployment models where we reach somehow a kind of Pareto optimum, right? in the sense that there's no refactoring that we can do. Uh, well, there are refactorings that we can do to improve this uh, insensitivity goal, but then automatically we sort of break or we violate a, a different one. So that's something we want to look at. Um, secretly, so, but you know, we also are trying to find uh, ways to, to somehow incorporate a little bit of quantitative information in the models as well. Because especially if you, as part of your refactoring, start adding cues and caches to your model, which might be you know, uh, very useful from a sensitivity point of view, you are going to increase the latency of your system. And so uh, we think it would be, would be very nice if we can make some meaningful statements about that as well in the model. Uh, but the main challenge, of course, is you know, to do that within On the implementation side, basically all, all our efforts are geared towards making this, uh, this, this exploration of this design space more efficient. So we're thinking about you know, having, a, the, having a kind of interactive mode where 
guide the exploration. Uh, we're thinking of um, applying uh, techniques for model checking and state space reduction techniques uh, and parallelization. Because this essentially, this exploration seems to be a kind of a, a very standard parallel uh, problem. So we should be able to do some stuff there as well. Okay, so the take on messages are that we have this project to uh, try to alleviate the bottom problem. Uh, we already developed a tool, and uh, in this paper, we basically formalized what the tool does. And uh, the main ingredients is uh, these architecture models, deployment models. We have this composition and congruence notion to formalize uh, refactorings, and then this uh, social sensitivity. Uh, this is all I wanted to say. So, thank you very much for your attention. I will start with some background information to explain why we work on this topic. So this figure describes uh, the cell differentiation process. We can see that pluripotent stem cells can change to progenitor cells and further differentiate into specialized cells, such as blood cells, bone cells, etc. So previously, people think this process is irreversible. However, it has been overturned by cell reprogramming techniques. Now with different cell reprogramming techniques, we are able to reprogram cell phase in different ways, such as de-differentiation, trans-differentiation. Trans so we focus on this trans-differentiation to uh, reprogram a specialized cell from one cell type to another. So this opens up a great opportunity to cure the most devastating diseases, such as cancer. And to do that, the first step is to identify efficacy targets for drug intervention. The conventional approaches are usually laborious, time-consuming, and enormously expensive. Therefore, in recent years, it has been shifted to more advanced techniques, such as approaches based on mathematical modeling. The modeling of biological systems allows us to identify drug targets with computational tools and methods. This is much simpler to execute, faster and less costly. Among several modeling frameworks, Boolean network has distinct, advant uh, distinct advantages. It provides a qualitative description of biological systems and thus evade the parameterization problems. The structure of a Boolean network is simple, and it is able to capture the important dynamical properties of biological systems. A Boolean network consists of a set of binary valued nodes representing biomolecular species, such as genes. Zero means the gene is not expressed, and one means the gene is expressed. Each node is assigned with, uh, with a Boolean function, which determines the value of the node as the next time step. So the Boolean functions describe the interactions between the genes. This figure shows the structure of a toy example with four nodes, and each node, uh, each node is given a Boolean function. The dynamics of a Boolean network evolves in discrete time under one of the updating schemes such as synchronous or asynchronous. Under synchronous updating, all the nodes update their values at the same time, while under asynchronous updating, only one node is randomly chosen to update at each time step. So the dynamics of asynchronous Boolean network is non-deterministic. We consider asynchronous updating more realistic because it allows biological processes to happen at different classes or time scales. The dynamics can be described as a transition system, as shown in this figure. So each node is a binary string represent, uh, representing a state, and each edge represents a transition from one state to another. I'd like to draw your attention to the size of the state space. 
For this toy example with only four nodes, there are two to power four states. So imagine a real life biological network with hundreds or thousands of nodes. The state space is exponential in the size of the network. This infamous state space exploring problem is the biggest challenge to analyze large Boolean networks. The long run behavior of a Boolean network are described as attractors, to one of which the system eventually settles down. In this, fig in this figure, I denote the attractors as the colored node. We can see that no matter where it starts, the system will eventually reach, it, reach one of the attractor and stay there forever unless perturbed externally. So we use attractors to characterize cellular phenotypes or cell fates, such as apoptosis, proliferation. So the identification of drug target can be interpreted as a control problem in Boolean networks. We aim at finding a subset of nodes, the perturbation of which can drive the network from a source attractor to a target attractor. Usually the source attractor is undesired and unhealthy, and the target attractor is a desired and healthy one. And the perturbation here means to fix the expression of the node to either one or zero. Depending on how long we apply the control, we can use different perturbations. Instantaneous perturbations are applied only instantaneously. Temporary perturbations are applied for a sufficient long time and then released. Permanent perturbations are applied for all the falling step, uh, all the falling time steps, which means permanently. To minimize the experimental cost, we are interested in the minimal solution with 100% reachability of the target attractor. And in our previous work, we have solved the minimal instantaneous control. Today, I will talk about our minimal temporary and permanent control methods. Before introducing our methods, I would like to explain two important concepts called weak basin and strong basin. So each attractor has a weak basin and a strong basin. The weak basin includes the states from which there exists a passes to this attractor but there may also exist passes to other attractors of the system. But strong basin only includes the states from which there only exist passes to this attractor, so they cannot reach other attractors of the system. For example, for this red attractor, its weak basin has uh, six states. We can see that a pass from a state in the weak basin is possible to reach this attractor but it's also possible to reach another attractor of the system. A strong basin has two states, itself and the state 1000. All the passes from a state in the strong basin will always eventually reach this attractor. So what happens if we apply the control? I will use this partial transition system to illustrate the control process. Suppose the network is currently in this uh, yellow state and we apply the control by fixing node x1 to 1. Only the states where x1 is 1 are preserved in the transition system under control. The other states are absent. So some attractors may disappear and some transient state may become new attractors. And for this case, the state 1000 becomes becomes a new attractor in the transition system under control. And the control drives the system from the yellow state to the state 1110. From there, spontaneous evolution will guide the uh, system to the uh, new attractor 1000. Uh, and then we release the control. The original transition system will come back the system, will, uh, the system will continue evolve to this red attractor. So this control is actually a temporary control. In this work, we have proved that a control is a temporary control if and only if it satisfies two conditions. The first is that some states in the strong basin of the target attractor is preserved in the transition system under control. This is to guarantee that 
by the end of the control, the system can reach a state in the strong basin of the target tractor, such that after we release the control, spontaneous evolutions will surely guide the system towards the target. For example, this, uh, the, the second figure shows the transition system under a control, and we can see that the orange state P, which belongs to the strong basin of the target tractor, is preserved in the new transition system. And the control drives the system from S to an intermediate state S prime and continue to evolve to state P. Then when we, uh, when we re uh, release the control, the original transition system come back and uh, it will continue to evolve towards the target. But to guarantee that during the control, the system will surely reach, uh, reach P. We will recompute the basin, uh, the basin of the remaining, remaining strong basin in the new transition system, and we need to check if S prime is belongs to the strong basin or not. If not, it's not a temporary control. So to find the minimal solution, we only need to explore the states which belong to the weak basin, because the states, the states outside the weak basin can never reach the target. So the first step is to compute the strong basin and the weak basin of the target tractor. Then we find the states in the weak basin that have the shortest Hamme distance to the source. For this case, there are two candidate intermediate states. 1110 and 0100. By comparing the source state and the intermediate state, we know which node to perturb and how to perturb. Then we watch, uh, verify one by one if the associated control satisfies the two conditions or not. For the first case, we will reconstruct the transition system under control since this state 1000, which belongs to the strong basin, is preserved in the new transition system, we will continue to compute a strong basin in the new transition system. Since this intermediate state is in its strong basin, so we say this control is a minimal temporary control. We do the same for the other candidate, uh, candidate control set. We reconstruct the transition system, and since both states which belong to the strong basin are preserved, we will compute their strong basin in the new transition system, and also the intermediate state is in the strong basin, so it is also a minimal temporary control. But if we didn't find any solution, we will exclude these two states from the weak basin and find the next uh, closest states in the, in the weak basin that have the shortest Hamme distance to the source and repeat the verification process. This is how our minimal temporary control method works. The permanent control is simpler because permanent control are applied for all the following time steps, so we will never release it. And a control is a permanent control from a source state to a target tractor if and only if the target tractor is preserved in the new transition system. Because if the target tractor disappeared, we can never reach it. And also to guarantee the reachability, the intermediate state S prime has to be in the strong basin of the target tractor in the new transition system. And to compute the minimal permanent control, is, uh, the algorithm is very similar to the minimal temporary control. We also compute the weak basin and find the start with the states in the weak basin that have the shortest Hamming distance to the source state and verify if the associated controls satisfy the two conditions or not. Just these two conditions are the conditions for the permanent control. So I will not uh, repeat uh, the example. There's a huge gap between theory and the reality, and to, bridge, uh, and to bridge the gap, practical constraints have to be incorporated. So our method can avoid the undesired perturbations. Since in real life, some genes are essential for cell survival, so we can never turn it off. 
and some genes may be very hard or very expensive to perturb in a, in a special way. All these undesired perturbations can be encoded as preconditions, and our methods can compute the minimal solution excluding these uh, undesired perturbations. To give you a real life example, the figure on the right side is the structure of the myeloid differentiation network. This network depicts the differentiation from common myeloid progenitors to four different cell types. We use our methods to compute the reprogramming passes from granulocytes to monocytes, and we compare their performance with our previous minimal instantaneous control. With instantaneous control, we need to control at least three nodes. But with temporary or permanent control, we need to control only one node. And there are two, two solutions. For this case, the temporary and permanent control return the same results. So we are done here, but it's time for biologists to consider which perturbation is easier to conduct, which one is less costly, and what are the side effects. Based on the specific experimental settings, they will choose the interesting solutions for later validation. We also applied our methods to several other biological networks. This three columns summarize the number of nodes, the number of edges, and the number of tractors contained by each network. The largest network we tested has 188 nodes. And this three columns summarize the number of perturbations required by different control methods. ITP stands for the minimal instantaneous, temporary, and permanent control, respectively. We can see that temporary and permanent control can reduce the number of perturbations compared to the instantaneous control. And also, this temporary control tends to uh, lead to the smallest uh, control sets. Here I only show the results for one pair of source and target tractors, but uh, I have tested on all combinations of source and target tractors. An uh, interesting result, uh, the, the results are very interesting because for almost all the cases, we need to control at most four to five nodes. This agrees with the empirical finding that the control few inputs can reprogram the cell phase. In terms of the comput computational time, our methods are quite efficient. For the largest network with 188 nodes, the computation can finish within two to three minutes. To conclude, we have developed the mean temporary and the permanent control methods for bullying networks. Our methods are minimal, efficient, feasible, and complete. Our methods can greatly reduce the number of perturbations compared to the instantaneous control. However, considering the intrinsic diversity and the complexity of biological systems, it's less likely to find one approach that can cope with all the cases perfectly. So we are exploring different uh, control strategies and we aim at, uh, we, we plan to provide a rich collection of solutions such that biologists can choose based on the specific experimental settings. So this table summarizes nine strategies. I think I will skip the exp explanation and uh, just give you an idea that we are still working on it. Mm, this leads to the end of my presentation. Thank you.